Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Jane's Fighters Anthology as we continue with the individual aircraft showcases. Today, we will be doing the Boeing 707. Now, this is another commercial airliner that I don't think was really featured in any of the uh, missions or campaigns that we've done. But, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, where do we want to fly? Honestly, France is probably the uh, one of the better ones. Panama. Well, let's do Panama. Why not? The Boeing 707 is an American long-range, narrow-body airliner, the first jetliner developed and produced by Boeing Commercial Airplanes. And it is often credited with kicking off the jet age, even though it wasn't the first jetliner. And it dominated passenger air transport in the 1960s and remained common through the 1970s. And continues to serve to this day mostly um, in legacy military aircraft such as the E3 AWACS uh, and certain refuelers. Let's get a look at the map here. Alright, so we will climb and uh, basic. This map's a bit smaller than I thought it would be, but uh, let's go south for now and uh, climb to a cruising altitude, and then we can uh, delve into the Boeing 707's history. And you'll notice it uses the generic bomber cockpit. Um, there we go, put her in a gentle climb. As we want to get up to around 30 to 40,000 feet, I believe that's what the uh, cruising altitude would be. Who does it, uh, are we any particular airliner? No, we are unmarked. Alright, that is fair enough. Now, during and after World War II, Boeing was known for its military aircraft, most famously the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-29. Super Fortress, as well as the jet-powered B-47 Stratojet and the B-52 Stratofortress. The company had produced aircraft that were not as commercially successful as those from Douglas and other competitors, and as Douglas and Lockheed continued to dominate the post-war air transport boom, the, the demand for Boeing's offering, the 377 Stratocruiser, quickly faded and only 56 examples were sold. The venture had netted the company a $15 million loss. During 1949 and 1950, Boeing embarked on studies for a new jet transport and saw advantages with a design aimed at both military and civilian markets. Aerial refueling was becoming a standard technique for military aircraft, with over 800 KC-97 Stratofreighters on order. KC-97 was not ideally suited for operations with the USAF's new fleets of jet-powered fighters and bombers. This was where Boeing's new design would win military orders. And we're going to incline a little bit here because we are losing a little too much speed in our climb. As the first of a new generation of American passenger jets, Boeing wanted the aircraft's model number to emphasize the difference from its previous propeller-driven aircraft, which bore 300 series numbers. The 400, 500, and 600 series numbers were already used by their missiles and other products, so Boeing decided that the jets would bear 700 series numbers, and the first would be the 707. The marketing department at Boeing chose 707 because they thought it was more appealing than 700. The project was enabled by the Pratt & Whitney JT3C turbojet engine, the civilian version of the J57, that yielded much more power than the previous generation of jet engines It was proving itself with the B-52. Freed from the design constraints imposed by limitations of late 1940s jet engines, developing a robust, safe, and high-capacity jet aircraft was within reach for Boeing. Boeing studied numerous wing and engine layouts for its new transport tanker, some of which were based on the B-47 and C-97, before settling on the 367-80 quad jet prototype aircraft. The Dash 80 took less than two years from project launch in 1952 to roll in May 14th of 1954, then first flew on July 15th, 1954. The prototype was a proof of concept aircraft for both military and civilian use. 
United States Air Force was the first customer using it as a basis for the KC-135 Stratotanker tanker aerial refueling cargo aircraft. Whether the passenger 707 would be profitable was far from certain. At the time, nearly all of Boeing's revenue came from military contracts. The demonstration flight over Lake Washington outside Seattle on 7th of August 1955, as pilot Tex Johnston performed the barrel roll in the 367-80 protest. Although he justified his unauthorized action to Bill Allen, then president of Boeing, as selling the aircraft with a 1G maneuver, he was told not to do it again. The 132-inch wide fuselage of the Dash 80 was large enough for four brass, two plus two seating, like the Straddle Cruiser. Answering customers' demands and under Douglas competition, Boeing soon realized this would not provide a viable payload, but widened the fuselage to 144 inches or 3.66 meters to allow five abreast seating and use of the KC-135's tooling. Douglas Aircraft had launched its DC-8 with a fuselage width of 147 inches. The airlines liked the extra space and six abreast seating, so Boeing again increased the 707's width to compete, this time to 148 inches. The first flight of the first production, 707-120, took place on December 20, 1957, and FAA certification followed on September 18, 1958. Both test pilots, Joseph John Tim Zissen and James R. Gannett, were awarded the first Ivan C. Kinchel Award for the test flights that led to certification. A number of changes were incorporated into the production models from the prototype. A Kruger flap was installed along the leading edge between the inner and outer engines on early 707, 120, and 320 models. This was in response to the de Havilland Comet overrun accidents, which occurred after over-rotating on takeoff. Wing stall would also occur on the 707 with over-rotation, so the leading edge flaps were added to prevent stalling even with the tail dragging on the runway. Alright, and we're actually moving a fair bit slower than I thought we would. So while we climb, I think we're going to adjust our course to 270, and we're basically going to head in for the uh, the runway at uh, this it this is it. What is that Tucker? I can't say Tucker, but whatever it is, that's where we're heading. All right, and you can see we have loads of fuel. This was meant for transatlantic flights, after all, and possibly even trans-Pacific flights. And we are almost at 270. And there we are at 270. And we will continue our climb. You'll notice that uh, climb performance is very slow versus the aircraft we're normally accustomed to dealing with. The initial standard model was the 707-120 with JT-3C turbojet engines. Qantas ordered a shorter body version called the 707-13A, which was a 120 with six fuselage frames removed, three in front of the wings and three aft. Frames in the 707 were set 20 inches apart, so this resulted in a shortening of 10 feet to a length of 134 feet and 6 inches. With the maximum takeoff weight the same as that of the 120, which was 247,000 pounds, 138 was able to fly the longer routes that Qantas needed. Braniff International Airways ordered the higher thrust version with Pratt & Whitney JT-4A engines, the 707-220. Final major derivative was the 707-320, which featured an extended span wing and JT-4A engines, while the 707-420 was the same as the 320 but with Conway turbofan engines. Dex Johnson recommended Boeing increase the height of the tail fin, add a boosted rudder, as well as add a ventral fin. These modifications were aimed at mitigating nuts roll by providing more directional stability in yaw. Though initially fitted with turbojet engines, the dominant engine for the Boeing 707 family was the Pratt & Whitney JT-3D, a turbofan variant of the JT-3C with lower fuel consumption and higher thrust. JT-3D engine 707s and 720s were denoted with a B suffix. While many 707-120Bs and 720Bs were conversions of existing JT-3C powered machines, 
Seminole 7320Bs were available only as newly built aircraft, as they had a stronger structure to support a maximum take takeoff weight increase to 19,000 or sorry, by 19,000 pounds, along with modifications to the wing. The 707-320B series enabled non-stop westbound flights from Europe to the west coast of the United States and from the U.S. to Japan. The final 707 variant was the 707-320C, C for convertible, which had a large fuselage door for cargo. It had a revised wing with three section leading edge flaps, improving takeoff and landing performance and allowing the ventral fin to be removed, although the taller fin was retained. The 707-320Bs, built after 1963, used the same wing as the 320C and were known as 707-320B Advanced Aircraft. In total, 1,010 707s were built for civilian use between 1958 and 1978, though many of these found their way to military service. The 707 production line remained open for purpose-built military variants until 1991, with the last new build 707 airframes built as E3 and E6 aircraft. Traces of the 707 are still found in the 737, which uses a modified version of the 707's fuselage, as well as the same external nose and cockpit configurations as those of the 707. These were also used on the previous 727, while the 757 used the 707 fuselage cross-section. And we are now getting close to, uh... Oh. That was... We're losing altitude. I guess we're at our ceiling now, so, uh... Because our nose is pointed above the horizon and we're losing altitude. <laughs> so I'm not too worried about that. We'll just level off here. We must have a lower cruising altitude, perhaps between 25 and 35,000 feet. But we can adapt. And you can see we're noticeably slower than, um... Modern military aircraft or uh, civilian aircraft. We're speeding up now, but the top speed of like a 747 or other similar modern aircraft would be around Mach 0.8, and we're maybe Mach 0.6 right now. 707 wings are swept back at 35 degrees, and like all swept wing aircraft, display an undesirable Dutch roll fly characteristic that manifests itself as an alternating combined yawing and rolling motion. Boeing already had considerable experience with this on the B-47 and B-52, and it developed the yaw damper system on the B-47 that would be applied to later swept wing configurations like the 707. However, many pilots new to the 707 had no experience with this instability, as they were mostly accustomed to flying straight-wing propeller-driven aircraft such as the Douglas DC-7 and Lockheed Constellation. On one customer acceptance flight, where the yaw damper was turned off to familiarize the new pilots with flying techniques, a trainee pilot's actions violently exacerbated the dust roll motion and caused three of the four engines to be torn from the wings. The plane, a brand new 707-227 and 7071 destined for Braniff, crash landed on a riverbed north of Seattle at Arlington, Washington, killing four of the eight occupants. In its autobiography, test pilot Tex Johnston describes the Dutch Roll incident he experienced as a passenger on an early commercial 707 flight. As the aircraft's movements <clears throat> me, did not cease, and most of the passengers became ill, he suspected a misrigging of the directional autopilot, yaw He went to the cockpit and found the crew unable to understand or resolve the situation. He introduced himself and relieved the ashen-faced captain, who immediately left the cockpit feeling ill. Johnson disconnected the faulty autopilot and manually stabilized the plane with two slight control movements. The 707 uses engine-driven turbo compressors to supply compressed air for cabin pressurization. For many commercial 707s, the outer port number one engine mount is distinctly different from the other three as this engine is not fitted with a turbo compressor. Later model 707s typically have this configuration, although American Airlines had turbo compressors on engines two and three only. Early 707 models often had turbo compressor fairings on all four engines, but with only two or three compressors installed. The JT3D, JT3D-3B engines are readily identifiable by the large gray secondary air inlet doors in the nose cowl. These doors are fully open, sucked in at the rear, during takeoff to provide additional air. Doors automatically close with increasing airspeed. 
707 was the first commercial jet aircraft to be fitted with clamshell-type thrust reversers. Pratt and Whitney, in a joint venture with 7Q7 and Omega Air, selected the JT-8D219 as a replacement power plant for the Boeing 707-based aircraft, calling their modified configuration a 707RE. North Rock Grumman selected the 219 to re-engine the U.S. Air Force's fleet of 19 E-8 Joint Stars aircraft, which would follow, which would allow the J-Stars more time on station due to the engine's greater fuel efficiency. NATO also planned to re-engine their fleet of E-3 Sentry AWACS aircraft. The 9 is being publicized as being half the cost of the competing power plant, the CFM International CFM-56, and its 40 decibels quieter than the original JT-3D engines. The first commercial orders for the 707 came on October 13, 1955, when Pan Am committed to 20 Boeing 707s and 25 Douglas DC-8s, dramatically increasing their passenger capacity over its existing fleet of power aircraft. Competition between the 707 and DC-8 was fierce. Pan American ordered these planes when, and as they did, so that they would be the first operators of the first off-production line for each aircraft type. Until their initial batch of aircraft had been delivered to them and put into operation, Pan American would have the distinction of being not only the launch customer for both transcontinental American jets, but the exclusive operator of American intercontinental jet transports for at least a year. The only rival in the intercontinental jet aircraft production at the time was the British de Havilland Comet. However, this was never real competition for the American market, as the Comet series had been the subject of fatal accidents due to design flaws early in its introduction, but drawn from service virtually redesigned from scratch and reintroduced as version 4, it was also smaller and slower than the 707. Several major airlines committed only to the Douglas DC-8. Airlines and their passengers at the time preferred the more established Douglas aircraft maker of passenger aircraft. Douglas had decided to wait for a larger and more fuel-efficient engine, the Pratt & Whitney JT-4A, and to design a larger and longer-range aircraft around this engine. To stay competitive, Boeing made a late and costly decision to redesign and enlarge the 707's wing to help increase range and payload. The new version was the 707-320. Pan Am was the first airline to operate the 707. The carrier inaugurated 707 service with a christening at National Airport on October 17, 1958, attended by President Eisenhower, followed by a transatlantic flight for VIPs, which were personal guests of founder Juan Tripp from Baltimore's Friendship International Airport to Paris. The aircraft's first commercial flight was from Idlewild Airport, New York, to Le Bourget, Paris on October 26, 1958, with a fuel stop in Gander, Newfoundland. In December, National Airlines operated the first U.S. domestic jet airline flights between New York, Idlewild, and Miami using 707's lease from Pan Am. But we have lift failure. I think we're going, yep, we were going a little too fast, so we'll slow down to 80% for better fuel consumption. American Airlines was the first domestic airline to fly its own jets on January 25th, 1959. DWA started domestic 707-131 flights in March, and Continental Airlines served 707-124 flights in June. The airlines that only ordered the DC-8, such as United, Delta, and Eastern, were left without jets until September, and lost market share on transcontinental flights. Qantas was the first non-U.S. airline to use the 707 starting in 1959. The 707 quickly became the most popular jetliner of its time popularity led to rapid developments in airport terminals, runways, airline catering, baggage handling, reservation systems, and other air transport infrastructure. The advent of the 707 also led to the upgraded upgrading of air traffic control systems to prevent interference with military jet operations. As the 1960s drew to a close, the exponential growth in air travel led to the 707 being a victim of its own success. 707 was now too small to handle the increased numbers of passengers and the routes for which it was designed. Stretching the fuselage was not a viable option because the installation of larger, more powerful engines would need a larger undercarriage, which was not feasible given the design's limited ground clearance at takeoff. Boeing's answer to the problem was the first wide-body airliner, the Boeing 747. The 707's first-generation engine technology was also rapidly becoming obsolete in the areas of noise and fuel economy, 
especially after the 1973 oil crisis. In 1982, during the Falklands War, the Argentine Air Force used 707s to track the approaching task force. They were escorted away by Royal Navy Sea Harriers without being able to approach closer than 80 miles. Operations of the 707 were threatened by the enactment of international noise regulations in 1985. Shannon Engineering of Seattle developed the Hush Kit with founding from Tracor Incorporated of Austin, Texas. By the late 1980s, 172 Boeing 707s had been equipped with the Quiet 707 package. Boeing acknowledged that more 707s were in service than before the Hush Kit was available. Trans World Airlines flew the last scheduled 707 flight for passengers by a U.S. carrier on October 30, 1983, although 707s remain in scheduled service by airlines from other nations for much longer. Middle East Airlines of Lebanon flew the 707s and 720s in frontline passenger service until the end of the 1990s. Since late of Argentina removed the 707 320Bs from regular service in 2007, Saha Airlines of Iran was the last commercial operator of the Boeing 707. After suspending its scheduled passenger service in April 2013, uh, continued to operate a small fleet of 707s on behalf of the Iranian Air Force. As of 2019, only a handful of 707s remain in operation, acting as military aircraft for aerial refueling, transport, and AWACS missions. And I think we're close enough... Oh, we are... Eh. I think we're close enough to begin a small descent. A slow descent. And I think we can increase our thrust a little bit. Although certified as Series 100s, 200s, 300s, etc., the different 707 variants are more commonly known as Series 120s, 220s, 320s, and so on, where the 20 part of the designation is Boeing's customer number for its development aircraft. So first variant we have is the 707020. Announced in July 1957 as a derivative for shorter flights from shorter runways, the 707020 first flew on November 23, 1959. Its type certification was issued on June 30, 1960, and it entered service with United Airlines on July 5, 1960. As a derivative, the 720 had low development costs, allowing profitability despite few sales. Compared to the 707-120, it has the length reduced by 9 feet, a modified wing, and a lightened airframe for a lower maximum takeoff wave. Powered by four Pratt & Whitney JT-3C turbojets, the initial 720 could cover a 2,800 nautical mile range with 131 passengers in two classes. Powered by JT-3D turbofans, the 720B first flew on October 6, 1960 and entered service in March of 1961. It could see 156 passengers in one class over a 3,200 nautical mile range. A total of 154 Boeing 720s and 720s were built until 1967. Some 720s were later converted to the 720B specification. 720 was succeeded by the Boeing 727 Trijet. The 707-120 was the first production 707 variant with a longer, wider fuselage and greater wingspan than the Dash 80. Kevin had a full set of rectangular windows and could seat up to 189 passengers. It was designed for transcontinental routes and often required a refueling stop when flying across the North Atlantic. Alright, now let us level out and turn too much bank. <laughs> gotta use the. Uh, oh. Gotta use more rudder. Alright, turn to 310. And we can level out here. And let's just make sure our nose is above the horizon. There we go. Air 4 Pratt & Whitney JT-3C-6 turbojet civilian versions in military J-57, initially producing 13,000 pounds with water injection. Maximum takeoff weight was 247,000 pounds, and the first flight was on December 20, 1957. Major orders were the launch order for 2707-121 aircraft by Pan Am and an American Airlines order for 3707-123 aircraft. First revenue flight was on October 26, 1958. 56 were built, plus 7 short-bodied 138s. The last 120 was delivered to Western in May of 1960. The 707-138 was a 120 with a fuselage 10 feet shorter than the others, with 5 
feet or three frames removed ahead of me on the wing, giving increased range. Maximum takeoff weight was the same 247,000 pounds as the standard version. It was a variant for Qantas, thus had its customer number 38. To allow for full load takeoffs at mid-flight refueling stop Fiji, the wing's leading edge slats were modified for increased lift and thus allow and the allowable temperature range for use of full takeoff power was increased by 10 degrees Fahrenheit. 7138s were delivered to Qantas between June and September 1959, and they first carried passengers in July of that year. The 707-120B had Pratt & Whitney JT3B-1 turbofan engines, which require more powerful and more fuel efficient, rated at 17,000 pounds foot, with the later JT3D-3 version giving 18,000 pound foot of force. The thrust did not require water injection, eliminating both the system and 5,000 to 6,000 pounds of water weight. 120B had the wing modifications introduced on the 720 in a longer tail plane. Total 72 aircraft were built, 31 for American, 41 for TWA, plus 6 short body 138Bs for Qantas. American had its 23 surviving 123s converted to 123Bs, but TWA did not convert its 15 131s. The only other conversions were Pan American's 5 surviving 121s and 1 surviving 139, the 3 aircraft delivered to the USAF as 153s, and the 7 short body Qantas 138s, making 13 in total 707s delivered to Qantas between 1959 and 1964. The first flight of the 120B was on June 22, 1960, and American carried the first passengers in March of 1961. Last delivery was to American in April 1969. Maximum takeoff weight was 258,000 pounds for both the long and short body versions. Alright, we can start zooming in our map now. The 707-220 was designed for hot and high operations with more powerful 15,800 pound foot Pratt & Whitney JT-4A-3 turbojets. Five of these were produced, but only four were ultimately delivered, with one being lost during a test flight. All were for Braniff International Airways and carried the model number 707-227, first entered service in December of 1959. This version was made obsolete by the arrival of the turbofan-powered 707-120B. The 707-320 Intercontinental is a stretch version of the turbojet-powered 707-120 initially powered by JT4A-3 or JT4A-5 turbojets producing 15,800 pound foot each, and most would eventually get the upgraded JT4A11s that produce up to 17,500 pound foot each. The interior allowed up to 189 passengers, the same as the 120 and 220 series, but improved to class capacity due to an 80 inch fuselage stretch ahead of the wing with extensions to the fin and horizontal stabilizer extending the aircraft's length further. The longer wing carried more fuel, increasing range by 1,600 miles and allowing the aircraft to operate as a true transoceanic aircraft. Wing modifications included outboard and inboard inserts as well as a kink in the trailing edge to add area inboard. Takeoff weight was increased to 302,000 pounds initially and to 312,000 pounds with the higher rated JT4As and center section tanks. Its first flight was on January 11, 1958. 69 turbojet 707-320s were delivered through January 1963, the first passengers being carried by Pan Am in August of 1959. Alright, coming to 15,000 feet, we should actually be able to see See the airport soon. So I'm going to continue our descent to 10,000 feet. The feeling it's in that uh, patch that's uh, being rendered as water right now because the game kind of tends to default to that. Oh, maybe not. Is it below us? Like, are we above it? No. Where is this airport? Uh, this is the uh, downside to flying a civilian aircraft is that uh, we have no radar. So I can't, or infrared for that matter. So I cannot lock onto it using a sensor system. 
Honestly, I'm amazed they even gave us an RWR, but that just might be uh, a requirement in the game that everyone have that. Because <laughs> certainly uh, the 707 would not have an RWR in its civilian version. The 707 420 was identical to the 320, but fitted with the Rolls-Royce Conway 508 turbo fans of 18,000 pounds thrust each. The first announced customer was Lufthansa. The OAC's controversial order was announced six months later, but the British carrier got the first service-ready aircraft off the production line. Oh, is that the... Nope, we aren't landing there. <laughs> I did not realize that was going to be a small runway like that. Alright. Tonkri. Uh, oh. uh, we'll go back to uh, Santa Fe. That looked like a decent city. The British Air Registration Board refused to give the aircraft a certificate of airworthiness, citing insufficient yaw control, excessive rider forces, and the ability to over-rotate on takeoff, stalling the wing on the ground. Defaulted to the half Comment one. Boeing responded by adding 40 inches to the vertical stabilizer, applying full instead of partial rudder boost, and fitting an underfin to prevent under rotation or over rotation. Modifications, except for the fin under the tail, became standard on all 707 variants and were later retrofitted to all earlier 707s. The 37420s were delivered to BOAC, Lufthansa, Air India LL and Varig through November of 1963. Lufthansa was the first to carry passengers in March of 1960. Alright, we're a little low now, so let's pitch up until we can uh, find Santa Fe. The 707-320B had the application of the JT-3D turbofan to the Intercontinental, but with aerodynamic refinements. The wing was modified from the 320 by adding a second inboard kink, a dog tooth leading edge, and curved low drag wingtips instead of the earlier blunt ones. These wingtips increased overall wingspan by 3 feet. Takeoff gross weight was increased to 328,000 pounds. The 175-707-320B aircraft were all new build. No original 320 models were converted to fan engines in civilian use. First service was June of 1962 with Pan Am. 707-320B Advance is an improved version of the 320B, adding the three-section leading edge flaps already seen on the 320C. These reduced takeoff and landing speeds and altered the lift distribution of the wing, allowing the ventral fin found on earlier 707s to be deleted. From 1965, 320Bs had the upgraded 320C undercarriage, allowing the same 335,000 pound Take off max weight. These were often identified as 707 320 VA H. 707 320C has a convertible passenger freight configuration, which, quick, which became the most widely produced variant of the 707. 707 320C added a strengthened floor and a new cargo door to the 320B model. The wing was fitted with three section leading edge flaps, which allowed the deletion of the underfit. Total of 335 of this variant were built, including some with the JT3D-7 engines with 19,000 pound-foot takeoff thrust and a takeoff weight of 335,000 pounds. Most 320Cs were delivered as passenger aircraft, with airlines hoping the cargo door would increase second-hand values. The addition of two additional emergency exits, one on either side of the aft, either side aft of the wing, raised the maximum passenger limit. The 219. Only a few aircraft were delivered as pier freighters. One of the final orders was by the Iranian government for 14707-3J9C aircraft capable of VIP transportation, communication, and in-flight refueling tasks. Alright, let's find this airfield now and hope that it's not another uh, dirt... Uh, it's another dirt strip. Alright. Uh, Santiago, I think that's what that's saying. That will be our uh, next attempt at landing. We'll find a city eventually. <laughs> uh, man, this would have been great for like a Cessna 208 or something. 
Alright, so this should line us up with the next airport on the list. Seven hundred seven seven hundred was a test aircraft used to study the feasibility of using CFM International CFM fifty six engines on a seven hundred seven airframe and possibly retrofitting existing aircraft with a new engine. After testing in nineteen seventy nine, and seven hundred seven QT, the last commercial seven hundred seven airframe was restored to seven hundred seven three twenty C configuration and delivered to the Moroccan Air Force as a taker aircraft via a civilian order. Boeing abandoned the retrofit program since it felt it would be a threat to the Boeing 757 and Boeing 767 programs. The information gathered from testing led to the eventual retrofitting of CFM-56 engines to the United States Air Force C-130-KC-135R models and some military versions of the 707 also used the CFM-56. The Douglas DC-8 Super 70 series with CFM-56 engines was developed and extended DC-8's life in a stricter noise regulatory environment. As a result, significantly more DC-8s remain in service into the 21st century than 707s. Alright, let's see if, uh... Okay, so unfortunately that does not increase rendering distance like I was kind of hoping it would. But, uh... There are numerous undeveloped variants, including the 707-620, which was a proposed domestic range stretch variant of the 707-320B, which would have carried around 200 passengers. There was also the 707-820, which was a proposed intercontinental stretch version excuse me, of the 707-320B. It would have had a max takeoff weight of 412,000 pounds, powered by four... Pratt and Whitney JT3D-15 turbo fans capable of producing 22,500 pound force engines. And, like, the, uh, most of these variants weren't pursued because they would have required a massive, uh, design time as well as massive changes to the aircraft that would have been rather expensive, so it would have been difficult to retool lines to produce these. And ultimately, um, they were canceled in favor of the 747. Now, the militaries of the U.S. and other countries have used the civilian 707 aircraft in a variety of roles and under different designations. 707 and U.S. Air Force's KC-135 were developed in parallel from the original Boeing 367-80 prototype. The Boeing E-3 Sentry is the U.S. Military Airborne Warning and Control Center control system aircraft based on the Boeing 707. That provides all weather surveillance, command, control, and communications. Northrop Grumman E-8 Joint Stars is an aircraft modified from the Boeing 707-300 series commercial airline. E-8 carries specialized radar, communications, operations, and control subsystems, with the most prominent external feature being the 40-foot canoe-shaped radome under the forward fuselage that houses the 24-foot APY-7 ASA radar. Uh, side-looking airborne radar antenna. The VC-137 variant of the Stratolighter was a special purpose design meant to serve as Air Force One, the secure transport for the President of the United States. These models were in operational use from 1962 to 1990. First presidential jet aircraft, the VC-137B designated SAM-970, is on display at the Boeing Museum of Flight in Seattle. Two VC-137C aircraft are on display with SAM-26000 at the National Museum of the United States Air Force near Dayton, Ohio, and SAM-27000 at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Alright, we should be right on top of, uh... Right on top of this airfield. Don't tell me I missed it and it's another freaking dirt strip. It's another dirt strip. Okay. I swear I saw a conventional airport somewhere around here. Alright, let's go to Santa Rosa. Surely the city we passed earlier, which might have been Santa Rosa, will have a, uh, a conventional airport. Canadian Forces also operated the Boeing 707 with the designation CC-137 Husky. 
707, which was based off a of 707 347C from 1971 to 1997. Boeing 717 was the company designation for the C-135 straddle lifter and the KC-135 straddle tanker derivatives of the 36780. 717 designation was later reused in renaming the McDonnell Douglas MD-95 to Boeing 717 after the company merged with Boeing. All right, there we got a we got a city and a real airport. Uh, excellent. Okay, so we will uh, begin lining up for landing procedures. All right. Now today, as said previously, the uh, 707 is not in service with any major civilian airliner and is really only operated by military operators. Although, American actor John Travolta actually owned an ex-Qantas 707-138D with registration N707JT. However, he donated the plane in May of 2017 to the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society near Wollongong, Australia. The plane will be flown to Illawarra Regional Airport, where Harz is based once repairs are completed to ensure safe flying condition. Oh, all right, we got to turn a little more. And that about sums it up for the 707 as the, uh, basically the inaugural plane of the uh, jet era. And now we're going to see how she does in landing. I will say, at least as far as the uh, game is concerned, she's pretty smooth flying. And there's not really any, uh, any problems with Dutch rolls or anything else, but then again, this is not the most realistic flight simulator, you know, being a study sim and all, but. All right. Time to line up. And it looks like our ILS is queued in, which obviously they wouldn't have. They have to go entirely manual. Uh, I think we're a little... Yeah, we are way too high right now. So we're going to dive to try to throw on our brake and dive so we can get into a good lineup here. Always practicing that bad landing technique. <laughs> but, uh, okay, there we go. We are still losing altitude. Drop thrust to 29%. Let's bleed off another couple knots. Oh, we gotta bleed off more because we are still going too fast to do a proper descent. There we go. Now we got a proper descent going. We can increase thrust again. Probably. 40, 50. Eighty percent. Ninety percent. Make for a nice gentle landing. And boom, touchdown. Right at the start of the runway. A great landing, more or less. <laughs> uh, we'll throw on the brake and come to a full and complete stop, and then uh, taxi on over to the, uh, I guess what we'll pretend is the uh, terminal here. Okay, I'm not coming to a full and complete stop. Okay, I guess I am. <laughs> Turned on time compression. Wow, 37% thrust at 8x compression to get this baby to move. That's, uh, Welcome that's wow. Back. All right, they have welcomed us to the airport. So now we are just gonna taxi around, whoa. Taxi around and we can see, I believe a SAM site is over there. So wave to the SAM site, boys. Probably the closest we'll ever get to one without it shooting at us. Looks like a Hawk battery, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 
Yep, Mim 23. Alright. And rotate. Alright. Let us continue taxiing through. And rotate. The fact that this can turn on a dime is absolutely silly, by the way, but we'll just ignore that. And rotate. All right, line her up. And will we glide to a stop in time? Yes, we will, actually. I won't need the brake at all. There we go. And we have come to a full and complete stop. And you can kind of see the low clearance it has between the engines and the ground. And obviously when pitching up, there would not be a lot of clearance between the, uh, the tail and the rear of the plane and the ground either. So... That about concludes uh, this episode, so let's head to debriefing for all that's worth. Alright, so that covers the Boeing 707. It looks like we'll have a small glut of commercial Boeing airliners to cover before we can resume with the more mil interesting military aircraft, but that's fine. I mean, these aircraft play a critical role in commerce these days, so... And, and in military service, too. I mean, obviously, you know, this aircraft has military variants, as do most others. Um, the Boeing 747, for example, is a presidential aircraft. Uh, and at one time, it was actually considered to, as a mobile launching platform for up to, I believe, something like 78 cruise missiles? Or uh, ICBM, so... Um, these obviously have had their military applications as well. But uh, until next time, thank you all for watching and stay tuned for next time and stay safe out there and we'll see you then.